Gracious God, we thank you so much for the gift of life. Thank you for every day you give us. Lord, we want so much to know you more, to really hear your voice, and, and, and to learn from you. So we're coming together today to talk about ways that we might do that. We might draw closer to you. We might get to know you more. And we might be, be better hands and feet in the world for you. Thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, <laughs> Suzanne. Suzanne, okay. People might call this class that we're doing um, spiritual disciplines. But um, I don't know, what is that word discipline to you? <laughs> what do you think when you hear that word? Well, I was in the military, so it means regimentation. Regimentation. What branch? Anybody else have any? Any reaction to the word, word discipline? I, it, I'll tell you, it, it's, to me, it means doing what you don't want to do, and make, but making yourself do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't necessarily resonate, shall we say, with the word discipline in, in terms of spiritual disciplines, because it seems to me that that makes the motivation different. You know, when you say discipline, I'm doing what I have to do. I'm going to grip my teeth. and I'm um, But I much prefer to think about what we do spiritually, what we try to learn spiritually. The practices are because we love God. And it's a response to our love of God that we do these things. And so I, it, I will, you won't hear me using the word discipline unless it's by accident. It's more I, I, spiritual practices. I was one of those kids, I think, that just started off very early sensing God's presence. Or and wanting to learn more about how to be a good person that I came across was 1 Thessalonians 5. 16 through 18th, which says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. And the part about pray without ceasing really stuck out to me, and I could not figure out how in the heck do you do that? How do I pray without ceasing when I'm sitting in school and I got to listen to the teacher or, you know, whatever, or my mom has me doing the dishes or whatever? How do you pray without ceasing? And then um, as I grew older, that, that kind of expression. So I was in about my uh, late 20s, early 30s. I had two toddlers. I worked as an RN. I was pretty active in my church. And, um, and, I, and I was a mother of two toddlers. <laughs> and I wanted to pray, but I thought... I, there's no, and I, I read all these things about what well, you need to set aside for a time in the morning. And it's like, how in the world am I going to do that? Because if I sit down and try to have a quiet time and two, <laughs> two little rug rats running around making noise, and I mean, they just, and what are they into now? And no, it didn't work. So in the midst of that, I truly believe the Holy Spirit drew me to this bookstore called The Bread of Life. And in the Bread of Life, I found this little book by Brother Lawrence, The Practice of the Presence of God. And I started reading it, and, and I went, oh, my goodness, here's how you can praise without ceasing, but you don't have to stop what you're doing. And that was, like, mind-boggling to me. It, 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 like, it was um, an amazing. So I want to tell you about the author because it, it, he has such an interesting story. His name was Nicholas Herman, and he lived in Lorraine, France. And um, he was a lay brother, so not ordained or anything, um, a lay member of the Discalced Carmelites. You know what Discalced means? It means shoeless. The Carmelites of, these, of this order didn't wear shoes. And they were sandals? Nope. Oh, they were barefoot. Teresa of Avila was also a discalced Carmelite. 
where did they live? Um, uh, for, uh, he lived in France, she lived in Spain. So the order was all over Europe. So I just wondering if they were going to get frostbite. In their <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Um, yeah. I, I don't know how, I, I don't know the, the, how that worked. The ins and outs of how that worked. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but anyway, he, um, he, he, had, he, he was not uh, an educated man. Um, and he had this conversion experience when he was 18 years old. And he wrote about it. And he was out, I think, on a walk. And he saw a dry, leafless tree in the middle of winter. And he just saw it. And, you know, it's just the way the Holy Spirit works. Why did that wake him up? Who knows? But it was a moment when gazing at that tree, he suddenly ex had a powerful experience of God. And so he, it, it, was, it moved him so much that he wanted, his heart's desire was to walk constantly in God's presence because that was such an amazing experience. And he said, I want to do this for the rest of my life. And so it, it became his heart's desire and his goal in life to figure out how could he be constantly aware of the presence of God. And he lived for 80 years in those days. Um, That's that pretty amazing because he, he lived in the 1600s. So to live 80 in the 1600s was quite an accomplishment. But what he did is he, um, he, he joined the discalcids in a desire to get closer to God, to experience God's presence. And because he wasn't educated or ordained or anything, they put him to work in the kitchen. He was the one in charge of the groceries and, the, and buying the wine and um, scrubbing the pots and pans. And, um, and, and so he was so busy with all of that that he could rarely get to the prayer. You know, they had regular times of prayer all during the day and he didn't get to all of them. And so he also had this need, how can I pray when I've got all my work to do? Now, I want to just say one caveat, and I think you've started reading him. Um, you have to take Brother Lawrence um, and understand that he's a man of his time. So, so some of what he says, it's a more severe spirituality um, because in 1600s, there was a much more severe idea of who God was and what God wanted of us. So, for instance, he says things um, in here uh, that kind of lend themselves to, well, just accustom yourself to suffering and meditate a lot on sin and hell and, um, and, and your own wretchedness and, um, and that God brings illness into our life in order to teach us or, or illness and disaster. So... He, you have to. We're still going to have illness and disaster in the twenty-first century. Filter that out <laughs> when you're reading him, because you know I don't think even the Carmelites today would say those things. But but it was a, it was a time when there was a severity about uh, the, the Christian faith. Um, but but don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, because in amongst all that kind of suffering and wretchedness and there, there are nuggets in here that can change your life and they certainly changed mine because it made it helped me in the same way it helped brother lawrence how in the world do i pray when i've got two toddlers running around that need me and a church that needs me and a hospital that needs me <laughs> so um so that's so um so what i want to do today is just share with you some of the nuggets that you can get out of this book. I'm, I'm filtering it out all that other stuff for you so that you can hear what the nuggets are. So the very first thing that he teaches is, don't think I can't bother God with something this small, or I can't, you know, oh, God's too busy. He's taking care of the big stuff of the world. Brother Lawrence would say, Form a habit of conversing with God continually and, and, and never ever imagine that God doesn't have time for you or God doesn't want to hear from you. 
no, no matter how small the issue. Um, I remember hearing a, a talk one time um, where the woman said, do you pray for the peanut butter in your life? And it was a story about how she did a after school care in a garage because there were so many kids in her neighborhood um, <laughs> that, that were just running around the streets getting into trouble. And so she started an after school program, a fun thing, fun things in her garage. And she gave them snacks and stuff when they got home because most of them were, were what do they call them, dorky kids? Latchkey latch kids. So anyway, she began to pray because she didn't have the money to buy a lot of snacks. She began to pray for peanut butter. And she just talked to God about it and said, I need peanut butter for these kids. And, and, and lo and behold, a neighbor who drove a truck for, uh, I think it was Alpha Beta at the time, and the, the truck got in an accident and a full load of peanut butter, <laughs> cans, they were in cans, I think she said they were big, that fell, it rolled out the back and got dented and could no longer be sold. And so he said, I know somebody who could use. <laughs> so God provided the peanut butter. So her whole point was nothing's too small. Nothing's too unimportant to talk to God about. Anyway, I was going to tell you when I was in the throes of, being an RN and being a, a mother and all of that stuff. I mean, I, I had lumps and bumps in my life, believe me. And the way I would deal with them, and don't please don't laugh at me, but I, when I would get in the shower, I had a pretend therapist. And I would imagine that I was telling my therapist <laughs> and I would just, you know, talk in the shower. Nobody could hear me and I just let it all out. And I think part of you just down the download was helpful. But what was weird is that when I read Brother Lawrence's idea of having this constant conversation with God, I thought, well, I guess if I can do it with an imaginary therapist in the shower, <laughs> maybe I can do it this way. Maybe I can do it with God. And he says the motivation always do it out of love for God. In fact, he says, do everything out of love for God. And I remember a woman that we had in our altar guild for years. She was just a lovely German lady. And she, man, she, she whipped those altar linens into shape, let me tell you. But whenever you would say to her, thank you so much for doing thus and so or whatever you're doing, she'd say, I do it for the Lord. That was her, her constant response. And that's what Brother Lawrence would say, I do it for the Lord. Um, because out of, out of love, it's, it's out of relationship, out of, um, out of feeling that connection, and therefore you want to, you want to talk to God. Um, he said, at one point in his book, he says, even if I pick up a piece of straw from the kitchen floor, I do it for the Lord. So he, every action from him um, was out of, out of love. Um, Another thing he did, he spoke a lot of what I preached on last week, which is our poverty. Um, always be aware of your utter dependence on God. And, and, you know, in our society, that's really hard because we're kind of a rugged individualist and, and we kind of look down on people who, who need help. But, but Brother Lawrence would say, be aware of your of your." Um, your utter dependence on God. And his prayer often was, um, he would say to God, I cannot do this unless you enable me. So he always knew that the power, the gifts, the ability, the strength, the courage, whatever he needed to do a task, it wasn't his. It was God's who gave it to him. And therefore he knew he was dependent on God. And he said, the only thing that you need for a relationship and to have a conversation with God is a willing heart. There's no other requirements. There's no other fancy stuff, you not no fancy knowledge you need to have. You don't have to have memorized the whole Bible. <laughs> I mean, the only thing you need is a willing heart, that your heart wants to know and be connected with God's heart. Um, and he would say, and this is, this is really interesting because it almost, in a way, 
it's disturbing in a way what he says, but listen to this. He says devotions, you know, the devotions that we do, whatever it is, whatever they are, they're only a means to attain the end. Being with God is the end. Being in God's presence, that's, uh, that's the end. And so once your devotions lead you to the awareness of God's presence, then chuck the devotions. You know, they're not needed anymore. He said, you've accomplished what the devotions were meant to do. And he, he said, often people begin to think the devotions are the end. Mm. And so if, you know, if they, they experience the presence of God, they go, oh, I've got to get back to my prayers, you know, because if they find, they, they've made the devotions more important than actually being with God. Uh, so I thought that, that one was a real, uh, that nugget was a real important one to me. Um, when he had to go to work, I got to read you this prayer because sometimes he wanted to go to prayer, but he couldn't. And so he had this prayer uh, for the presence uh, when he was going to go to work. Um, so he, he's feeling like he doesn't want to, he, he doesn't want to leave prayer, but he has to, he has to go to work. And then he says, God, um, oh my God, since you are with me, and I must now, in obedience to your commands, apply my mind to these outward things. I beseech thee to grant me the grace to continue in your presence and to, to, and, and to this end, do thou prosper me with thy assistance. Receive all my works and possess all my affections. As he proceeded in his work, he continued his familiar conversation with his maker imploring his grace and offering him all his actions. And when he finished, he examined himself how he had discharged his duty. If he found well, he returned thanks to God. If otherwise, he asked pardon. And without being discouraged, he set his mind right again and continued his exercise of the presence of God so if he had never de as, as though he had never deviated. So it was this thing of, okay, you've given me this work to do, so I gotta, I, I, I can't just sit here and be in, in your presence. I've got to do stuff, but, but I beseech you, allow me to still experience your presence while I'm working. And it, it was just, and so people began to notice this radiance coming from him. Here's the guy working in the kitchen. Here's the guy bringing in the loads of groceries, and 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 he was radiating. And so pretty soon, priests and lay people and bishops even came for miles to talk to him, or they wrote letters and he wrote back to them his answers. And some of the letters are in here. Um, he, hi, Mary. Um, so so the whole idea was. He discovered that if he asked for it, that he could continue to experience God's presence, even though he still had to do his work. And that's when the light bulb went off for me. Because if I could do the same thing, if I could ask for the same thing, then while I was changing diapers, I could experience God's presence. I, it didn't have, see, I think a lot of times we compartmentalize our spirituality. There's my prayer time and there's a work time. And there's two completely different things. And what Brother Lawrence teaches is, no, it's all of a one. It's all, it's all connected. And, it, and it, if your intention is that you want to be in God's presence while you're doing this other stuff, it will be given to you. It was on the way to work today, I was listening to a song, and it, it was the part of the scripture passage about ask, ask, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open. It's that kind of thing. It's if you want to experience God's presence while you're doing other stuff, it will be given to you. Just ask and God will show you the way so that, and, and mostly it's intention because he prayed that prayer before he went to work. And so God honored it. 
And so he was able to learn. And the, um, so, so I think that's, he says to continue to work on this habit of conversing interiorly with uh, Now, one thing he teaches you is that at first it's tough. It's not easy in the beginning to keep a conversation, you know, to remember even to, to have a conversation with God. But he said, keep it up because it's like anything. It's like anything you do, it practice makes perfect. And so you keep continually having a conversation with God, what you're feeling, what you're thinking, what you're fearing, what, you're, um, what you love, what you're grateful for, whatever. And you, you know, like when I'm not uh, driving, the temptation when somebody is being an idiot on the road, um, it is to just kind of fume at them. But instead, now I've learned, just offer them to God. You didn't, You have no idea what's going on in that person's life. I just saw um, a thing on, you know, that neighborhood thing on, on uh, there's a neighborhood thing where everybody in your neighborhood posts stuff. I can't remember, what's it called? Kelsey Gray, something. neighborhood something. Anyway, lo and behold, this guy was, they had posted a picture of a, of a car going out at crazy on, he was video, he had videotaped her gone crazy and, the, and he was fuming at her. And he finally managed to get her to go off the off ramp because he was afraid she was gonna kill somebody. And she got out of the car and he was ready to just lower the boom on her. And she said, I'm sorry, I just found out I have pancreatic cancer. I always think about that. You don't know, did that person just lose somebody? You know, uh, somebody died or they're being called to the hospital because somebody got in an accident and they, someone they love. And so, so even as we're driving, we can practice the presence. We can be talking to God. Oh, Lord, look at that person. You know what's wrong with them. And I pray you heal that, but Meanwhile, protect them, send angels around the car, you know, whatever. And it's just this constant back and forth. He says that if you continue to work on this habit of conversing interiorly with God, he said soon it will be as difficult for you not to think of God as it was at first to remember to think of God. That it becomes this continual. And, and so it'll happen without you even thinking about it. It just there, there it is. And, and so the conversation continues. He says, eventually, the time of busyness and business does not differ from the time of prayer. In the noise and clatter of my kitchen, he says, while several persons are at the same time calling for different things, I possess God in as great a tranquility as if I were upon my knees in front of the blessed sacrament. But it, it's because this constant conversation with God, soon his heart is open to God's heart and he, it becomes a presence that he's completely aware of. And you get to know, I mean, I'm just telling you this from decades now of practice with this. You just know the presence. You know kind of the nature of God's presence. You know what it feels. It's, it's weird. It's deeper than just a feeling, but it's in the core of your being, you know God's, what God's presence feels like. And that's what he's saying here. Is it, whether you're, like I would, I could feel the presence when I was right in the middle of an operate, operation. Because I, in the last, the last gig I had at hospital, I worked in the OR and, um, you know, I scrubbed on some hairy cases. We were a trauma center and, and I could be talking to God, praying for the person and doing the surgery all at the same time. But, it, it, but it's practice. It's, it's constantly being aware so that, you know, and, and here's the other amazing thing that happens. I can walk into a place and it can either I can either feel God's presence or I can feel God's absence. I, I mean, I can tell when I need to pray presence into a place. If you just get so accustomed to what God feels like that you can just tell. And when I was trying to decide whether to come here, 
the, the dean's had taken me out to lunch and asked me to consider it. And, um, and so I said, well, I'll, I'll pray about it. And I meant that. I, I wasn't going to do anything until I had, I prayed a good long while about it. And so one of the things I decided to do was to come to Compline here and get a feel for the place. And, and, and I think what I was doing is seeing, did I feel the presence here? And I walked into Compline and Earl was there. Earl, my, what's his name? Earl Munger. Munger, or Earl Munger. And um, so I sat down next to him and I'm just like, <laughs> I was, I could feel the presence just sitting next to Earl and, 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 and the whole, the whole place here felt like it. I mean, the presence of God is really powerful in, in this community and in you people, I can feel it in you. And so I, that, that's when I was able then to say, yeah, I don't want to come because um, God's here and I, and I want to help whatever I can do to do uh, support the work. There's something good happening here and I don't want to be here to support it. So that's what I mean when I say, um, even in the midst of the worst of circumstances, I'll tell you another experience that I had. I'd by, by then probably uh, 20, 20 years of practicing the presence. And I think I've told you this story, but I'll, I hope I don't bore you. But um, one night I was home getting ready to go to vestry meeting at, at my home parish. And um, not a door. No, it was dark, you know, 7.30. And here was my daughter and my son-in-law who had just been married three months ago. And I had no clue why they were there. And it was so unlike them to just show up. And my daughter shrugged her shoulders and did this. And, and I thought, wow, what? you know, so come in, you know, into the family room we go. And immediately my son-in-law burst into tears. And he said, I've just been diagnosed with AIDS. And I mean, I can't even tell you what that felt like. It was just like, this is not even happening. It can't be happening. It doesn't happen to our family. You know what I mean? You just think those thoughts. But at the same time, I was washed over with a sense of the presence. I could feel God's strength, mostly strength. And somehow, rather than falling into a mother falling apart, um, I, I became the priest. And I was able to wrap my arms around them and, and, and just, you know, just I kept, what kept coming out of my, my mouth was Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And, and I was able to, to somehow come with them both. It, it was an extraordinary experience, but... I'm telling you that when you practice the presence, you can experience it in the worst of times. So, you know, when scripture says, well, you know, you know that you can experience joy, it's not ha ha ha, jumping up and down, just happy joy. It's that in the middle of the worst possible things that can happen to you, you can experience the presence, and that's joy, to know that God is that close to you in the middle of it all, that, that God's not just looking from afar and saying, oh, you know, or, or, or I did that to you because you need to learn a lesson or whatever. Instead, to feel this loving, caring, compassionate presence, it's extraordinary. And, 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 and that's what Brother Lawrence says. It'll pretty soon you'll be able to experience it no matter what you're doing or where you are. So I got to read you his kitchen prayer because this is my favorite of all the things he's ever written. <laughs> and he wrote this while he was working in the kitchen. He said, Lord of all the pots and pans and things, since I've no time to be a great saint by doing lovely things or watching late with me, or dreaming in the dawn light, or storming heaven's gates. Make me a saint by getting meals and washing up the plates. Ooh. Warm all the kitchen with thy love, 
and light it with thy peace. Forgive me all my worrying and make my grumbling cease. Thou who didst cease. Thou who didst love to give people food in room or by the sea, accept the service that I do. I do it unto thee. And that's my favorite thing. He, and it's just so beautiful because it's so humble. I mean, he was a humble man. He, he constantly reminds you that he's not clever like the other monks, you know. He's, he's a simple man. And he, uh, this is another comforting thing that he taught me. You don't become holy all at once. <laughs> but it's a process. And we're all on this journey and and we're we're in the process of salvation. And I I I I know I mentioned this recently, but it's so important. The church has screwed up that word salvation, and I just makes me angry because they've turned it into Jesus is going to come and save you from the fires of hell, and God, and God's going to throw you there it, unless you got Jesus to get you out of it. And it, it ruins the word salvation because salvation means wholeness, being made whole in mind, in body, in spirit, and it has nothing to do. That's a, that's a human invention, the idea that salvation means being saved from the fires of hell. And I can't remember when it came about, but somewhere in the Re Re Reformation. They decided that that's what it meant. But we, because of that, we miss the idea that, that all of our life is God's gift to us to get us to wholeness. And it's a process. And, it, and, and so we, we needn't be hard on ourselves because it's God's work to do in us. And all our work is, is to avail ourselves of it to have our hearts open to it. And, and, and then we will be made whole. And, and there's no, absolutely no question in my mind that God's heart's desire for every single one of us is to be made whole, to all the broken places in us to be healed, all the wounds to be healed, and, 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 and to bring alive in us all the very best parts of who we are. That's salvation. That's wholeness. And that's what God is doing for us every single day. We can wake up every day in the morning and say, thank you, God, for my, the salvation that you're going to be giving me today. Whatever work you're doing in me, thank you. But Brother Lawrence knew that. And, <laughs> and this is this just delight. It tickles my heart. This is something that he, <laughs> you get a little bit kind of egotistical in this <laughs> practicing presence. <laughs> he, he says, you know, um, when, you, when you spend a lot of time with God and experience his presence, you discover that you're God's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> he says, the king, a full of mercy and goodness, very far from chastising me, embraces me with love, makes me eat at his table, serves me with his own hands, gives me the key of his treasures. He converses and delights himself with me incessantly to a thousand and a thousand ways and treats me in all respects as his favorite. It is thus I consider myself from time to time in his holy presence. It, it's just, it's so sweet, you know, but, but, but that's what it is. It's, it's so I, some of us have had a, a grandma that, that was like that. I mean, you go to grandma and you are her heart's delight. She will just shower you with everything she could shower you with. Um, you're her favorite. You always felt like, even in, in, my, in my house, my Nana lived upstairs and there were three of us. And I'm certain that when my two sisters visited, she, we, we were only allowed to go in her room when she invited us in. And when she did, Sometimes I get to sit and hold my hands and hold the yarn, and she'd roll balls. She was a professional knitter, so so I, she would roll, and I would sit. <laughs> and my reward was that I would get um, cheese sandwich with watercress in it <laughs> and sherbet, and I loved that rainbow sherbet. And um, and I know that I thought I was her favorite. It's and I bet you my sisters did this. It's do. funny you saying that because my sister and I each thought we were our mother's favorite. Mm. 
And I'm about three years older. And I used to say, I'm her favorite because I'm the older one. And my mother would say, you her pish, you're my little pistol, and she's my pigtail. Well, pistol is Yiddish for pigtail, but I didn't know the difference. So she oh, said, oh, oh, oh. but it oh, didn't yes. matter no. because she made us feel like we were that important. Yeah. And that's the essence. It's feeling yeah, like it is. And that's what happens when you um, are constantly at least seeking the presence of God. And, and in, as time goes on, you know, accomplishing it, to actually experiencing, you do begin to understand your belovedness. Mm-hmm. You know that you're beloved. You can't, you can't deny it because whenever you're in the presence, you can feel it. You can just feel that compassion for you. And so you screw up, and it's like, <laughs> brother Lord, he said, when he finds that he'd forgotten God or he screwed up or whatever, he had these two characters that he would always pray. One would say, my God, here I am, all devoted to you. And that would kind of bring his attention back. Or, Lord, make me according to your heart. And, um, and, he, and he would say, you know, if I if I do something bad, if I make a mistake, I just say to God, and I used to be so mad at Brother Lawrence for this, but I finally grew to understand it. He'd say, see what happens to me when you leave me to my own? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, that resonated with me so much. You did to me too. Yeah. It's like, see what happened when yeah. you see it. So I'm God, never gonna, I'm never going to, I'm never, that's what I'm going to do if, if you're not with Exactly. Actually, you know, and I used to think that was a lazy excuse because I was raised in the kind of time where it's, you're responsible for your own actions and blah 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 blah. And, but but that's part of the poverty you see that he talks about is is you have to understand that without God you're going to screw up. Right, and that's what, exactly what it happens. You know, yes. you forget to pray. Mm-hmm. You know, for a week or two, then you get nastier. I do nastier, and nastier. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And lazier and lazier, and all those things. Yeah, you can't do anything. You know, it, I used to sometimes it, 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 uh, pray. There's God, a I didn't, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, brother. No, I said there's a poem about um, by Alan Hobson. I think he is. The last, the last line says, "Lord, if I." forget you please don't forget me yeah there you go that's yeah. exactly it yeah. Yeah. that's great i love that but i used to sometimes say which was kind of silly but i say to god why didn't you remind me to do my homework yeah <laughs> <laughs> another beautiful image that he gives you is it's not necessary to be at church to be with God, that we have this uh, sometimes misunderstanding about the fact that we've got to be at church if we're going to be in God's presence. He says, we can make our heart, he calls it your oratory. That's another word for chapel. Mm-hmm. You can make your heart your chapel, and you can visit it from time to time all during the day. So I love that image of kind of you're a walking chapel. Mm-hmm. And in it, you have the sacrament. The, the, you know, like, like we have the, the sacrament and the ombre and the, and the candles mm-hmm. burning, that, that we're walking around. We have that pre- same presence in us and our, in our little chapel. And we're carrying it out into the world. And so wherever we go, we're carrying that presence with us in our little chapel. So I like that a lot. Um, and then he says, don't forget to ask for God's grace and to offer him your heart. That those are the most important things to this life is don't forget to keep asking for help to do this. Don't take it on as your work and you're going to do it and you're going to, you know, no, that's not how this works. How this works is to have a humble an open, willing heart, and to ask for God to give you whatever you need to accomplish it. I, I'm just telling you, I'm a, I'm a walking, <laughs> I'm a walking example of someone who has done this now for, hmm. Ooh. 
over 40 years. Mm. Over 40 years. And I can tell you that his presence is stronger and stronger. And so, and oftentimes now, instead of it being me having to prime the pump, it'll come to me and draw me in. So, so uh, sometimes I can have almost an ecstatic, you know, you just feel so much joy that you can, you, you think, oh, I'm going to get to work. <laughs> I'm going to drive the car. <laughs> but um, I just highly, highly recommend it to you. So that's kind of what I had prepared. And I just, you know, if you have any questions or comments. I have a question. Mm. I hope this, I hope this is not offensive to you, but in light of your situation last week, do you, do you how, how, if at all, would you apply what you shared? With mm. Well, because and everybody may not know. What yeah. Okay, so I'll tell you, um, for those who don't know, was um, I got to take me to uh, somebody in Lord, and I had a chalice in one hand. And the problem since I arrived here is that every single stall in this place is made for a six foot tall man. Mm -hmm. And so I'm constantly trying, and especially with all the steps, every steps that I go up and down, I've got to remember to grab the stall and lift it up so that I don't trip over it. Trouble where I had something in both my hands, and I couldn't, and I couldn't, um, and I and I, I didn't have anything to grab the stole with, and so I just went for it without. I mean, I shouldn't have done. I should have either put the purificator in my other hand, so I had one hand to grab it, or I should have given that to someone else. Something, but I tripped over the stole and I went flying. I mean. <laughs> I can't believe the distance I covered, actually. <laughs> it was quite miraculous. And I hit my head right here on the wooden step. And um, man, I mean, it, it, it was kind of stunning, you know, <laughs> I guess is the way you could say. And I immediately began to get this big purple egg on the head. And, um, it, but it answers your question. The people that came over to me and cared for me and loved me, that was, I, I mean, I recognized the presence all around me in the middle of it. I really did. And, and, there, and there was so much love and concern. And Ada ran to her apartment and got these little, really cool thing, cocktail balls <laughs> that were out of the freezer and put them in a baggie and, you know, right me almost immediately, and somebody else took my clothes off. They apparently disappeared because I had nothing to wear this morning at church. We had to find something. <laughs> somebody probably, because the wine spilled all over me. I'm guessing somebody took them home to wash them. And maybe they didn't remember to bring them back. I don't know. But, but, it, but, but the love and the care and the concern that everybody had for me. And the little notes during the week. And it was just... It was the presence. I was surrounded by angels. <laughs> but I think also there have been others of us, in fact, I shared this morning, every time we went up to the altar, my heart starts pounding because I realized those ropes are too long for me. Well, it's not the ropes so much, it's the stoves. Still, the, yeah. the ropes are made for me. Yeah, okay. They're my so own. Over here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, so, so you can't. Uh, and, no, you can't like tie it in a knot in the back. I mean, it looked tacky. Yeah. So, so I just. take them in? Well, or, that's what um, Martha Reese told me. She contacted me during the week and she said, when you're ready, come down and I'll. She'll, she's a seamstress. Okay. She said, I'll shorten a few for you. Okay. I need one for each season. Yeah. But the other thing, not to worry, the acolytes have decided another another evidence of love in the presence. They notified me this morning that from now on, one of them is going to be there to give me an arm when no. I'm going up the step or down. Good. So that's what I mean. It's just this. There's this love here that is just makes me weep. Mm -hmm. 
makes me wait to clear. Yeah, we can freeze. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I'm nothing. No, that's, that's all right. But I just said, Father Mark, he weeps. You know, he doesn't weep, but you know, like you, he gets teary. Yeah. Which other, which but Andy can mark it. She gets teary too. But I think there's also another message is that maybe there's something we need to do within the church to make it safe. Yeah. I think that's the other message. Well, I've often thought, you know, I mean, I have a bad knee, and so it makes it hard for me to get up and down the steps. Right. And I think some people could be more handicapped than I am. And, yeah, and um, people don't go up to the high level. Yeah, yeah, and how, right, and how, what about a person in a wheelchair that they feel they can't come forward for communion? You know, we, something isn't welcoming, it, 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 as welcoming as it could be. Right. Well, you don't so, love steps. Yeah, we're talking about just, oh, yeah. just the way it's not. Do you have a question? Oh, I was saying that's the reason I no longer um I no longer serve on the altar. I'm no longer a chalice bearer because I am just scared of those stairs. Yeah, my knees are really bad. So you know, this is a loving community. It might be something that we can talk about right. and say, what can we do about this? Yeah. Linda, thank you. I'm going to rush off because I have a lunch appointment. I don't usually do this, but it was important. Somebody fl flew out from East Coast to see me. So, congratulations. Thank you. Favorite. That's right. We'll give, give us your final pearl of wisdom that you want us to hold on to. Final pearl of wisdom. Final pearl of wisdom. I would really tell good. you absolutely, there is a presence with us always and the only reason we don't know about it is because we just don't allow ourselves to be aware it's you know the buddhists talk a lot about awareness and that's it's it's really true i mean awareness to be begin to even in the conversation you have with god i've had i've, I've done this so so show me your presence you know, it's it's about the willingness to want to learn. But there's more than just what our six senses tell us. You know, there's there's another dimension that that is. Well, I used to say that it runs alongside this dimension, but I don't think it's interwoven in this dimension. And it's possible to perceive it. It's possible to experience it. It's possible to be aware. And once you allow yourself the, the willingness to, to, to know that and to see it and to experience it, then um, it'll happen to you. And, and it, weird little things will happen. We, I was talking to a, a priest friend of mine last night and we were saying, you know, when you are in that willing place and you're willing to see what's intermingled, the dimension, the spiritual dimension that's intermingled with our dimension, um, little coincidences begin to happen. You get the most, the darndest, we had both opened up our, this is what started the conversation, our, um, our, our, we had Chinese food and we had opened it up and we're reading a little thing in our cookie. And it just blew our minds because what he got and what I got, it was like perfect for us. And 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 I and I said to him, you know, sometimes something like that will happen in front of another person, and they'll, oh, those things always happen to you. <laughs> As though, oh, I've got some kind of special. I'm special. No, it happens to all of us, but we just need to be aware and open ourselves up to seeing it. It's like getting new, new glasses. I mean, you see with the whole, and you go, oh my God, God's constantly getting through to me or trying, you know, God's constantly showering me. And, and so that's what I would say. It's just, you know, step out of this place and just practice the presence. Where do we get the book? Uh, online, um, I got it from Amazon. It's called Pract The Practice of the Presence of God from Brother Lawrence. It's cheap. It's very little, as you can see. And um, I got it. Yeah, I mean, you can get it used on Amazon for next to mm -hmm. nothing. That's, what, that's how I get most of the books I buy them used, because I buy the ones that say very good condition. Mm -hmm. They're like brand new. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you, everybody. See you next week. Oh, I, I forget what, what's on the docket, but but we're gonna continue with what I wanna keep, what I wanna do with these four weeks is to kind of tell, I said, Bishop Ricard said, oh, that should be fun, your class today. I said, yeah, cause I'm gonna tell him the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> so next week will be another secret about living this life that we're living and, and really getting something out of it, you know? So, you. all right, see you next week.